Yeah, I have like pterodactyl arm going on. <laughs> goes it it goes how does it goes for you it's gonna go great once i redo my mic again oh for the 800th time of course i love that you made no noise except for all the noise that your boom made (laughs) you were like silently staring at me with your happy face making you weren't even breathing i'm just so tired of adjusting this thirty thousand times because i'm never content never it's true insatiable I don't know if me adjusting the boom arm counts as insatiable. But you are with gummy bears. Yes. Shout out to cannibalism. Shout out to cannibalism. That is a really weird connection. (laughs) My brain does weird things now. I'm just saying, if anybody listens to this episode before cannibalism, they're going to wonder what the fuck cannibalism and gummy bears have in common. Yeah, I didn't really think that through. Welcome back to Taboos, though. Go and listen to Cannibalism if you're confused. It's true. Here we are plugging our own episode before (laughs) we even introduce the show. So if you're new here, welcome to Taboos. We are a podcast that talks about taboo culture while we drink. Wow, it has been a minute since we said what we do here. It is true. But I don't know if we're supposed to keep saying that or... Not, especially because we are such a free form, there's no method to our madness. Like, you could pick up at any episode. You don't have to listen consecutively to every single episode to understand or appreciate what we do here. That's true. Maybe every once in a while, just to let people who are new know what the hell is going on. Yeah, because, I mean, walking into this madness would be like, what... That's how I feel every time we record. (laughs) That's how I feel every day. Also true. Real. So shall we discuss what we're drinking? I would love to. Okay. Do you want to try saying the word? Uh Uh-huh. Because I practiced. I practiced so much. (laughs) We are drinking a delicious beer that Nick grabbed for us. It is called what we think is Terrapin. T-E-R-R-A-P-I-N beer company is the brand and we are under the impression it is called luau the beer flavor it is a passion fruit orange and guava ipa and the just fuck holy shit yeah so here's the weird thing i am not even normally a fan of ipas they're generally too hoppy for me Mm -hmm. and i really like this i really like this it what's really interesting about this beer is that it's so dimensional up front, it tastes just like a Moon Man. It's got that orange, citrus, peely, hoppy, really intense bite to it that I love about Moon Man. But then as it sits in your mouth and you just kind of digest the flavor, the passion fruit has like a really nice finish. Yep. We don't normally dissect the beers, but I've never had this beer, so I needed to talk about it. It is really delicious. I agree. It's amazing. Good job, Nick. High five. High five. Love we, you. We could add beer dissection (laughs) to our patreon Mm -hmm. that'd be kind of fun do different reviews of what we've drank for the month yeah cocktail dissections or beer dissections or beverage dissections yeah yeah that you you know what you guys if you'd be interested in that let us know you can reach us at taboos on facebook taboos the pod on instagram and twitter and we are also on email (laughs) Wow. You can reach us by email at taboospodcast at gmail.com. Did I hit all of them? We also accept carrier pigeon. We do. Oh. And. I was not expecting that. That's Static's noise. He's a little pigeon. Also, we have a Patreon and we have a T Public page. Yeah, we do. We have merch. We have merch and we have Patreon. We have all kinds of shit. There are so, things out there. You can find us. If you find us, 
let us know if you'd be interested in Beverage Dissections, hosted by Allie and Celeste. I just have this image now of somebody, like, wandering around after listening to us going, yes! (laughs) Like, just (laughs) in the wild. Beverage selections! Dissections! Oh, yes, dissections. Yeah, I saved it. I saved your song. I don't even know what we're talking about. I loved it. You sang, and that's staying in the episode now. So, aside from getting in contact with us, with your thoughts on beer dissection. Beverage dissections. Beverage dissections. We want to thank everybody for everything that you've done over the past couple months. I'm sure people are sick of hearing us say this, but we're not going to stop saying it because we're grateful for you guys. So fucking deal with it. Just fucking deal with it. Like seriously, like I'm never going to stop being grateful. So you're going to hear about it all the fucking time. Sorry, we're grateful. Sorry, we're appreciative. We'll be less of that. JK, LOL. We've been seeing a lot of people share our newest episode that released today all over and taking people in it that they think should hear it, which it was about body positivity, which fuck yes, we need more of this in the world. All of it. And sharing our episodes, as we said in, I think we said in that episode, we're a grassroots podcast. The only way our message gets out there is through you guys, so we really appreciate all that you do for us. Seriously, we really do, and we have exceeded 2,000 listens. Last I checked, we were almost at 2,200, which, again, you guys, the milestone is just for us mentally because what we were discussing today is there's really no path for podcasters, especially grassroots podcasters, to really gauge their success. There isn't actual metrics to say this is what a successful podcast looks like. There are tools that we can use to gauge, but what really is important to us is just being heard. The rest of it is frosting, but if we can help one person with an episode, we're satisfied. That is our definition of success. We had two different listeners reach out to us for the body positivity episode specifically, just saying, Thank you for seeing me. Thank you for allowing me to be heard and represented. Like, that's such a big deal. And if there are more people who feel that way and who had that experience from the episode, I love that. We don't need to hear it every time, but it feels good to hear it, I guess, and to be able to say, like, we know for sure we help somebody. Mm -hmm. Because really, that was the point of this podcast. Exactly. I mean, we have our lighter episodes. But still, the feedback on those and hearing that somebody relates to them is awesome as well. Exactly. Exactly. And to your point, I mean, there are metrics to gauge a successful podcast, but that's not really our focus. Correct. Our focus is knowing that, to make it creepy, that we've touched people. But not by touching people. All I could think of was the song Bad Touch by Bloodhound Gang. And all I could think about was it puts the lotion on the skins. Okay, glad we both went there. So I guess basically what we're saying is if you related or enjoyed a specific episode and you want to let us know, please do so. Absolutely. We we're love that it. shit. Mm-hmm. It just tells us we're doing our jobs. Yep, exactly. So if you have done it already, please know how much that means to us. If you've been thinking about doing it and you're worried that you're going to seem weird or you're nervous about approaching us, please don't. Like, we seriously are here for it. What you hear on each episode, that's really who we are. Yeah. We're not, you guys, we're not doing shit for you. This is just us. This is just who we are. Yeah, we're not putting on any sort of act. This is 100% us. Exactly. So please don't ever be afraid to approach us, to reach out to us, to email us, to say thank you, to tell us if you don't like something. Seriously, that was part of the feedback that one of our listeners gave us today. He was expressing that he felt a certain way about the first half of the episode, but felt a different way about the second half of an episode. And we need to hear that, too. Yep, agreed. So please don't ever hold back. Like, except racists. We don't need to hear from you, motherfuckers. Like, please hold your racist thoughts. Like, not interested. Yep. But as far as any feedback about the episodes, like, we're here for it. Yep, 100%. Good, bad, or indifferent. Let's hit it. Agreed. On that note, should we dive into today's episode? Yeah, I'm very curious what we're going to talk about today. It's a heavy one. I'm ready. So today's topic is depression. 
All right. I thought this was a topic that absolutely needed to be discussed, especially heading into the holiday season and given the year that is 2020. I think 2020 should have come with a depression warning in general. Like an FDA label? Yeah. Agreed. Like, choking hazard, not safe for small children, may cause depression. Not safe for adults either. (laughs) Not safe for human consumption. I really think that's what should have happened. I agree. But we're almost through it, and whatever, let's let's all just say something to whatever it is that you believe in, that 2021 is fucking better. This glitch in the Matrix is over. We can all have a laugh. This was just a bad dream. Yep, on to a better year. Yes. And I feel really shitty saying that, though, because so many cool things have come out of 2020, and yet just terrible. Yeah, I agree. Like, we have this podcast Mm -hmm. from 2020. That's a... I'll never forget that shit. Mm -hmm. And yet also, the rest of the year happened. (laughs) Exactly. Like, (laughs) vaguely wave at everything else. Yeah, just this general shit happened. But, okay. I'm very excited to talk about depression. Excited feels like the wrong word. I'm very much looking forward to your research. I'm very interested to see where this conversation takes us, especially because, again, you guys, this is just us. Like, you are hearing a conversation that Allie and I would have anyway. Yep. Like, we might not have it with all of the the very specific statistics because she and I just don't communicate that way. We really do that for your benefit so you know we're not just making shit up, but the rest of the conversation we have is totally organic and real. So I'm very curious to see where this takes us. So I wanted to start out this conversation with a sort of disclaimer. Let's hear it. To any listeners that are currently suffering with depression, please hear me when I say it is okay to have depression. You are not broken or wrong. This is a real and human experience. You are beautiful and wonderful and you deserve happiness. If you ever want to talk, please reach out to us. Our DMs are open. And seriously, if you just want to reach out and say, hey, I'm having a rough day and just unload, we're here for it. We won't judge. We won't try to fix it. That's not who we are. We're just here to listen. Yep. So please feel free to reach out. I love that disclaimer. We also both are very talented at sending gifts, not gifts with a T. Gifts, as and you said DMs. So. On any of our socials, I pick some excellent gifts. I just want everybody to be prepared for that. I usually respond in GIF. That's why. Yeah, GIFs are basically my personality type. Preferred form of communication. If I could communicate via GIF, I just would. But Allie's correct. If you reach out to us, we're here for it, okay? Like, again, the reason we're doing this podcast is to represent people. And we know that sometimes talking to people is hard. Sometimes you just don't know who you relate to or you get good energy from like sometimes it's just hard so if we are those people who give you good energy and brighten your day or make you smile or make you laugh or we're just so annoying that you love us like we want to hear from you if you need our help if you need something we are here to listen and like Ali said judgment free nothing but light and love and gratitude that's it yep I agree here's me citing my sources let's hear it this is the highlight of the episode There are a few main websites that I got my content from, and there are a few quotes um, within the areas or sections that were more taken directly from that I didn't surmise that I will come back to and let you know who that's directly from. But in general, my information came from everydayhealth.com, medalerthelp.org, healthline.com, and the World Health Organization. So I thought I'd start it out this way. What is depression? So much of this was not even known to me. I was completely mind blown. In order to be diagnosed with major depressive disorder, you need to have five of the below criteria nearly every day for at least two weeks, according to the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. You know that that's like a 50-pound book. Yep. So that criteria is a depressed mood, loss of pleasure in all or most activities, significant weight change or change in appetite, change in sleep, change in activity, fatigue or loss of energy, 
diminished concentration, feelings of guilt or worthlessness, or suicidality. So, five of those every day for two weeks. Okay. I thought that was interesting. I didn't realize that there was criteria that had to be met or a large amount of criteria that had to be met for so long Mm -hmm. consecutively. Yeah. And two weeks is a long time to feel that way. Mm -hmm. Like, really? Mm -hmm. Two weeks is a really long time to feel that way. Two days is a long time to feel that way. When you're truly in that place, if you're experiencing those symptoms to the degree that they're saying that you're supposed to for that period of time, like, welcome to the dark hole. You know what I mean? Like, that's just where you live then at that point. And that's just rough. Yeah, exactly. So there are six generally accepted types of depression that we'll dive into more a bit later, but some overarching effects that are attributed to depression as a whole. According to the World Health Organization, about 3.8% of the world suffers from some type of depression. I honestly thought that number was extremely low. 3.8? Is that what you said? Yes. I would actually think like 3.8% of the world does not have depression. Yeah, pretty much. That's how I felt too. That can't be right. I believe you, obviously, because I know you did the research and I know how thorough you are, but like, that's insane to me. Yeah, I agree. And I'm wondering if it's, well, we can get into it more later. Okay. I have suspicions. The National Institute of Mental Health estimated that in 2016, 16.2 million or 6.7% of U.S. adults had at least one major depressive episode. In many countries, fewer than 10% of the people who have depression receive treatment. That statistic I do believe. Yes, I agree 100%. Depression is most common in ages 18 to 25 and in individuals belonging to two or more races. Women are twice as likely as men to have a depressive episode. Approximately 110 Americans take their own life a day due to depression, with 3,500 attempting to do so. I have a really ignorant question. Okay. Is there a difference between a depressive episode and having depression? We'll go into that a bit more when we break down the different types. Okay. Kind of. I wanted to ask because I truly don't know. I guess I could allude to the fact that there is a difference because one might be really intense but temporary where the other is permanent and I'm not trying to get ahead of ourselves. But I really wanted to understand that before we kept talking about statistics Mm -hmm. just to know truly the difference in my thinking about those statistics. Yep. Those are two of the six main types. Okay. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in the 15 to 29 year age range. Close to 800,000 people die due to suicide a year. That's so many fucking people. Mm -hmm. And especially because that age range starts at 15. Mm -hmm. That's so young. Yeah. That's so unbelievably young. That is just still a baby. And in really in the scope of life, 15 years old is just a baby. Yeah, I agree. Depressed brains do look different. The brain circuits actually function differently, and there's less activity in the areas that regulate emotion. The, probably pronounced, habenula, an area of the brain that covers stress responses, learning, sleep cycles, and other vital functions. Amygdala? Nope. I would know how to pronounce that one. Okay. Thank you, though. I wasn't trying to be dumb. <laughs> no. I've never heard of that term. Neither have I. But it's it's H-A-B-E-N-U-L-A. Okay. So it governs stress responses, learning, sleep cycles, and other vital functions. There's less activity in that area, and it registers and looks differently on scans. I have seen these brain scans, and actually, I think at some point, I would like to use the brain scan for one of the pictures that we use, if not the announcement picture. So, dear listeners, because you will be hearing this after we're completed with this episode, You will have seen the photo that we've provided to demonstrate the difference in a healthy brain versus a a brain that suffers from depression. Yep. Children are not immune to depression. Absolutely not. Those were just some of the overarching facts. Okay. Now, as so far as the types of depression, I got most of this information from Healthline.com. One of the main ones that most people are familiar with is major depressive disorder which is essentially a depressive episode, which is non, um, non non-consistent. Okay. It is literally episodic. Okay. 
It's estimated that 16.2 million adults in the United States, or 6.7% of American adults, have had at least one major depressive episode in a given year. I have had one. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, same here. The next most common form is persistent depressive disorder. You may have a single bout of major depression, or you can have recurring episodes. Persistent depressive disorder, or dysthemia, is chronic low-level depression that's lower in severity than major depression and lasts two years or longer. This occurs in 1.5% of U.S. adults in a given year. It's more prevalent in women than men, and 50% of cases are considered serious. So it is consistent. Mm -hmm. It generally doesn't just go away. But it is also the feelings from my understanding, are less intense than a major depressive disorder. Yeah, so I guess my little abstract brain heard you say that, okay? And again, the episodes is super easy to digest. Like, this happened, it was a bad moment. There may be future bad moments, but it's it's a moment that isn't minimizing it at all. But just, like, truly, it was a blip mm -hmm. of depression. The persistent, the way that my brain thinks about that in a abstract way is kind of just like constant rain. Mm -hmm. Like it's raining, which sucks. We can't go play outside. But it's not the end of the world. It just makes you feel just blah. I think though, taking your abstract manner mm -hmm. to my understanding, one of the differences is that the major depressive episodes could be there's a fucking tornado coming. Oh, yeah. Without question. I'm not in any way assigning weather analogies to an episode because, again, those episodes can vary yeah. in in a weather reaction, right? Like, mm -hmm. And now I think we should stick with that. Let's stick with assigning the different types, like a weather reaction, because everybody can go there. So even people who don't have depression or don't experience this or somebody who might be experiencing depression but don't realize that that's what they're working through, I think making it in an abstract sense might help people draw those connections. Yeah. So episodes could be any weather. Mm -hmm. Persistent is lots of rain. Persistent is like weather in England, from my understanding, where it's raining nine out of ten days. I could be completely wrong. If we have any English listeners, I'm sorry. I blame the media. <laughs> For her ignorance and her assumptions on your weather practices. <laughs> your weather habits. I've heard your tea is amazing. <laughs> we'll have to go sometime for some tea. Oh my god, I love this place. Let's do it. I'm very excited. On to the next weather category. The next is bipolar disorder. Okay. That's a type of depression? Yes. <gasps> That's fascinating. Yes. Okay. It's also known as manic depressive disorder and affects about 2.8% of the U.S. population in a given year. It occurs equally in men and women, while 83% of cases are considered severe. The disorder involves the development of a manic or energized mood episode. Sometimes, these may be preceded or followed by episodes of depression. The presence of these episodes is what determines which type of bipolar disorder is diagnosed. Hmm. Mm hmm I really struggle with the bipolar disorder one, not for anyone else, but I don't have bipolar disorder, but I really struggle with bipolar as a concept. I think one of the main reasons that bipolar is confusing for a lot of people is because society really only generally highlights the manic mm -hmm. portion of it and not the depressive portion of it. Right. I know people that are bipolar and I've seen both sides and both are very real. No, absolutely. And to assign a weather to bipolar disorder, I think about a hurricane that has a rainbow. Yeah. That is bipolar disorder. Yep. Another type of depression is seasonal depression, otherwise known as seasonal affect disorder, or basically your mood is affected by seasonal changes. The The anagram is sad. It makes you sad. <laughs> oh, I was like, what? I'm serious. No, yes. Yes. I thought you were talking about weather. <laughs> I, I mean, like, what anagram is weather? I always think about this one. I actually grew up with a girl who had really bad SAD and she just kind of turned into Eeyore. Mm -hmm. And now I can't I can't mentally associate SAD with anything but Eeyore. 
I can't relate SAD to a weather because honestly, it kind of is connected to the weather. Mm-hmm. It It is seasonal, but those seasons, not for everybody, but for this person that I grew up with specifically, the seasons like winter, her, her SAD was so bad in the winter. But then like in the spring, it wasn't better, but the the best time for her was summer and fall. Yeah. Ironically, you mentioned your, I actually did a paper in school as to a mental health issue assigned to every character in Winnie the Pooh. Of Winnie the Pooh? Yeah. I think that's fascinating. They all have something. They do. They really do. And I feel as though I've seen some sort of theory on that, like basically the premise of what you wrote your paper on. But Mm -hmm. I would love to have that conversation with you at some point because they do. They absolutely do all have something and I would argue that Christopher Robin has something. Oh, yeah. Because he can fucking talk to these animals. Mm-hmm. So, SAD affects up to 5% of the U.S. population in a given year. It's typically triggered by the onset of autumn and lasts throughout the winter, and it very rarely occurs in summer and spring. Geography and distance from the equator play significant roles in the disorder, Women also represent four out of five people with the condition. That's insane. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, something that's always really sat with me because SAD is something that I, again, I grew up around this, so I was a little bit more familiar with it. But I've always kind of been curious if it has anything to do with like a vitamin D deficiency because genuinely vitamin D deficiency can really fuck you up. Oh, yeah. And really, really fuck you up. Another part of it is that it messes with your incadian rhythm. Okay. I could see that. But I would be curious if not cure, right? And again, you guys, I'm not a fucking doctor, so I'm not over here trying to cure anybody or whatever. But I would be curious for people who do have SAD if vitamin D could help alleviate some of those symptoms. Yeah, it can to a degree. Mm -hmm. But... It's There's no a, cure. The, yeah. There is no cure. Like we should we should call that out too right now about any of these disorders. Yep. There is no cure and that's okay. It you shouldn't be ashamed to have any of these things if you do. Mm-hmm. I actually think I have that as a note later on. Okay. Well, beat you to it. Ha. <laughs> Works for me. The next type of depression is postpartum depression. Mm. As much as 80% of new mothers experience the baby blues and symptoms include mood swings, sadness, and fatigue. These feelings, related to the baby blues, usually pass within a week or two. Baby blues can be caused by hormonal changes following childbirth, lack of sleep, the pressure of taking care of a new baby, but if they persist for longer than a couple of weeks and severity escalates, it may be a sign of major depressive disorder with a peripartum onset, also known as postpartum depression. According to the American Psychological Association, about 10 to 15 percent of U.S. women will have a depressive episode within three months of childbirth. One in five new mothers experience minor depressive episodes, and as many as 10 percent of new fathers may experience this condition too. On the postpartum piece, approximately only one in five of the women suffering from the disorder will speak to a professional about their symptoms. There's so much to unpack there. Yep. Is this the point of the conversation where we can unpack it, or is that later? I don't want to mess up your rhythm. Oh, we can unpack it. Okay. So, first and foremost, I think the thing that's so glaringly obvious that I just kind of scratch my head at is, obviously, this is a thing. Mm -hmm. Because your body just spent nine months literally going through fucking hell. Mm -hmm. Okay? Nine months creating a whole nother human yep and then it's gone yeah and your body just like an your your body's addicted to all of those hormones that you just made you just spent nine months making Mm -hmm. to support this thing that your body was doing okay and then it's taken away from you Mm -hmm. and this isn't even in a sense of like anything about your baby just purely physically the thing your body was working so hard to make is gone mm-hmm. and you have all these extra hormones and you have all these e- this extra blood. Oh my God, your blood like triples when you're pregnant. Your blood 
per quart or whatever it's called, the blood in your body triples when you're pregnant. You just have so much happening, right? Inside your body alone. Mm -hmm. And then also, like you said, the pressure of taking care of a new baby. You're not sleeping. Do you know why you're not sleeping? Babies don't sleep. Nope. Babies, that's all they do is sleep, but it's not when you want them to. Oh, God, no. And that's the only consistent thing that we could say about anybody's experience because your experience is vastly different than my experience and our experiences are different than our mother's experiences and and everybody's experience is so different and everybody's baby is so different. Tiny was the best sleeper. She's always been a good sleeper. So that's never, ever been my issue, but I definitely had postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. Something else that's really difficult about postpartum depression, though, is that I often feel that there's this expectation around new moms, whether this is their first child or their fifth child, it doesn't make a difference, to be willing to ask for help. And at the same time, like we talked about in our single mom episode, single mom or not, it's really hard for moms to ask for help Mm -hmm. because this is something that we so instinctively believe we're just supposed to be good at. And when it doesn't work the way that we think it's going to, it's like, holy fuck, I'm bad at this. Mm -hmm. She won't stop crying. He's hurting and I can't figure out why. Like, we take all of that on as the mom and that's totally our responsibility. Yep, I agree with all of that. So now, not only are you going through literally a detox, a a drug detox, because your body was making all of the chemicals to make a fucking baby, and now the the warehouse is empty, and you're just left with all this product that makes a baby, right? You're not sleeping. You feel like a terrible mom because your baby is crying, because that's what babies do, and it's just all there. Yep. And again... That's the closest we could get to an all-encompassing experience because everybody's experience is different. Mm -hmm. And we might dive into this later, who knows, but I can tell you that I had postpartum depression and I didn't realize it until two years later. That's also what's so fucking tricky about it. I had postpartum depression and to this day, to this day, I don't know the difference between my postpartum depression and genuinely, what was the product of me being in an incredibly abusive relationship? Mm-hmm. I can't distinguish what darkness was which. Yeah. And I think that that's important for us to say, too, because we're both saying we had this. And we're both saying we had very different experiences and we didn't even know we had this. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just, that's sometimes how it is. Yeah. And what it really comes down to you guys, especially with postpartum depression, is the people around you. If the people around you notice that something is off, it's pretty much your obligation to say something to me as the new mom and someone you care about because my body's going through so much shit, I don't know what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. So if if you experience me, I'm not pregnant, but if you experience, if you experience me and I just had my do- I just had my baby, and you're like, wow, this doesn't seem very Celeste-ish. Like, this is this is very out of character for her. Say something. Mm-hmm. Broach it gently, but say something. Or I don't even have a good answer of how to do that, but I wish, I wish somebody would have said something when I had Tiny and I was like that and just really just asked. I think that applies to depression in general. You know what? I really, really appreciate you saying that because that is true. 100 bajillion percent. I think it's just so much easier for people to grasp postpartum depression because there's such an easy explanation of what's going on. Mm-hmm. That That's not to minimize, but I mean, seriously, postpartum depression is directly related to pregnancy. It's an easier concept for a lot Correct. Of a lot of people can be like, oh, okay, that totally makes sense why you have that. Yeah. Whereas depression, you could have a, you could live a beautiful life the most beautiful life and still have depression and people just don't understand when they look at what is surrounding you you have a beautiful life what do you have to be depressed about like that's the question that outsiders ask Mm -hmm. but but truly that's not the experience of the person suffering from depression Mm -hmm. 
So it's a lot harder, I think, for people to recognize and to broach that than it is with postpartum because there's a specific event that triggered it that's identifiable by everybody. Yeah, I agree. So hear us say that and really seriously think about that with with people who you experience and you know and you love and you care about. Like, just be cautious and weary of of some of the signs and some of the changes in behavior and Mm -hmm. ask. And and seriously, my personal opinion on this, as I'm thinking about how I would want someone to say something to me, because it, it would be really delicate. You don't want to offend somebody and be like, are you okay? Like, do we need to have a talk? But seriously, ask me if we need to have a talk. Mm-hmm. Ask me what's going on and if anything's wrong. I Like, I really don't have a good answer, but just ask. And you and I are a bit different in that, but that was something I was going to bring up a little bit later on. Okay. So I will come back to that from my own perspective. So for the final type of depression, it is psychotic depression. When major depression or bipolar disorder are accompanied by hallucinations, delusions, or paranoia, it's called major depressive disorder with psychotic features. About 25% of patients who are admitted to a hospital due to depression actually have psychotic depression. What was that percentage? 25. That seems like a lot. Mm -hmm. One in 13 people worldwide will experience a psychotic episode before age 75. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, though, as you age, Mm -hmm. your mind depletes. Mm -hmm. The elasticity of your brain. Yeah. So people that suffer from depression are probably more at risk for psychotic depression as they age due to the that potentially being a factor yeah that's really interesting to think about the i mean for lack of a better term deterioration Mm -hmm. right i mean that's what's happening you're losing elasticity in your brain and also it's slowly stopping like shutting down Mm -hmm. but to think about that added level of brain functionality to a brain that's already struggling to function. Yeah. To its fullest capacity that it used to be able to, right? And again, this isn't this is nothing that anybody can control or sometimes even recognize. So this isn't us saying that older people are broken, like that's not what we're saying or they're useless, like that I'm not saying that at all. Like Yeah, no. And I'm also not saying that older people are incapable. I'm not saying that either. I'm just saying from this perspective of one in 13 people at some point in their life will experience that that's a lot of fucking people Mm -hmm. so moving on from that are potential causes okay most of this comes from verywellmind.com one of the causes is potentially genetics people who have a family history of depression may have a higher chance of having it but that's not always the case for instance identical twins both developing depression only occurs about 30% of the time, according to the National Alliance on Mental Illness. That's fascinating. Yeah, I found that super interesting. And so weird that everything about them is identical except this. Mm -hmm. That's so bizarre. So brain chemistry imbalances on neurotransmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, and this word that I'm just going to butcher right now. Ooh, butcher it, baby. Norepinephrine. Those neurotransmitters impact mood regulation. So that's part of the brain chemistry part of it. Okay. Hormone fluctuations such as thyroid disorders, pregnancy, and puberty. Yep. Seasonal changes due to disruptions in circadian rhythm and less sunlight or vitamin D. Called it. Stress or trauma, such as loss, abuse, chronic stress, or huge changes in life, the hormone cortisol could be the reason for this. Factors like low self-esteem or chronic illness and substance abuse. So really, as you were talking through that list, I hear you say that those are all potential causes, right? But then think about somebody who experiences multiple of those causes. Oh, yeah. Right? You're a, a child, not even a child, you're a teenager going through puberty 
who's living in an abusive home, who's experiencing abuse, who's surrounded by drugs. I mean, I'm not trying to paint like the most devastating picture ever, but I'm just saying for an example, pile those things together. And that's a very real perspective for so many people Mm -hmm. all over the world. Not even the most dramatic of those contributors, but just even the less dramatic ones put together would just be such a really terrible cocktail of sadness. But sadness sounds like I'm minimizing and I'm not. I'm just, I'm trying to make it more digestible for people who don't know how to talk about this or people who don't experience this well, putting what you're seeing is putting even the most quote, not quote, but to say it, minuscule of those options together would be difficult for anybody. Yeah, that's exactly correct. I think about like the SAD and then I also think about like, I don't know, a vitamin D deficiency. Mm-hmm. Those two things alone suck. Mm-hmm. Okay. But then put them together. And they're pretty minuscule on the the list of things you get, like vitamin D deficiency compared to getting punched in the face every five minutes from your abusive fucking boyfriend. Those aren't the same thing. Yeah, exactly. But then put them together. Yep. Put getting beat every fucking day on top of SAD and also a vitamin D deficiency. Yeah. That, and those are just three of the examples that you gave of the contributing factors that you gave. Mm -hmm. Some people experience all of those things. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they still get up every day, whether it looks good or not, they deserve a fucking round of applause. Oh, hell yeah. That's a whole different kind of strength. That is a whole different kind of strength. It is. It is. And just, you guys, hear us say hats off to you. Mm -hmm. Mental illness in and of itself is hard enough, but extenuating factors adding into that is on a whole other level. It really is. It really is. And just, I don't have anything else to say right now. We'll move on to treatment options. Treatment options! So the generally suggested treatment options are therapy, medications, or lifestyle Lifetile changes. Lifetiles. Redo your bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> That'll fix it. Therapy, medications, or lifestyle changes. Often a combo provides the best results. From what I was reading, therapy and medication generally provides in cases that aren't high level extreme. Mm-hmm. Not the manic level. Yeah. Generally provides the same results. When you find a good therapist that Mm -hmm. you click with that actually works for you and a medication that works for you, one or the other generally works about the same amount, Okay, but both together are really the best option. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Lifestyle change examples are better eating habits, working out. I know working out is huge for me. It definitely increases my mood and endorphin levels. Um... Getting out of the house or finding hobbies, things of that nature, Mm -hmm. which is really hard when you're in a depressive episode. So Not only that, but it's also really hard right now, Mm -hmm. given the climate that we're in. Agreed. So obviously that research, the not the research, but the information that you found was pre-COVID. So also, I think a symptom or a, a classification, what did I say? What did I call them before? contributing factor of depression there should just be like a category that's called covid oh yeah i have a section on that (laughs) excellent i can't wait to explore that but seriously like you guys if if this was the year that fucked you up nobody would be surprised nope they also do sometimes use transcranial magnetic stimulation or electroconvulsive therapy to stimulate the areas of the brain that regulate mood In cases that medication and therapy is not helping. Okay. So to go to that comment on corona, this is a small little blip on it, but I did want to cover it. Okay. This is directly from time.com. Like Time Magazine? Yep. Okay. A pre-pandemic survey of 5,000 American adults 
found that 8.5% of them showed strong enough signs of depression, including feeling down or hopeless, loss of interest in things norm that normally bring joy, low energy, trouble concentrating, or thinking about self-harm to warrant probable diagnosis. When researchers surveyed almost 1,500 American adults about their mental health from March to April of this year, that number rose to almost 28%. Holy fuck. Holy fucking shit. Even more people, almost an additional 25%, showed milder signs of depression. People who said that they had less than $5,000 in savings were also about 50% more likely to suffer from depression than wealthier people the researchers found. That's real as fuck. Mm -hmm. That is such a real thing, and I, I really, really appreciate that you brought that into this because it sounds really weird to say, but financial... This is not a technical term, okay? Again, I'm not a fucking doctor, but financial depression is a thing. Oh, yeah, it's financial stress. Yes, but, like, to the level of genuine depression, mm -hmm. like, I... I can personally attest to that, that that's a factor mm -hmm. for me specifically. The vocalization of it is on paper, knowing that you're worth more not here than you are in your financial standing of being here. Yeah. Knowing that conceptually, this is not me encouraging anything negative or self-harm or anything, but again, just on paper. See, for me, this is my experience. Mm -hmm. Seeing that my bills out and my debt outweigh what I am capable of handling myself, mm -hmm. given the current state that I'm in financially, makes me, again, just solely on paper, mm -hmm. recognize that if I were not here, the majority of that debt, if not all of it, would be gone. Mm -hmm. So my life is only worth really what my debt is. Yeah. That by itself is a depressing thought. Yeah, I agree. And again, this isn't me. This isn't me being depressive. This isn't me having a depressive ex experience. But I have personally experienced this in my lifetime. And that's a real thing that people feel. Mm -hmm. And I genuinely didn't realize. I didn't realize that that was uh, something normal that other people felt. Until I read an article about a man who took his own life and the reason he took his life was because of that. Mm -hmm. And reading his story, I was just like, fuck, I feel this way. Yeah. Andrew Yang actually discusses this and just another reason why he should have been the DNC nominee. Oh Shout out to Andrew Yang. You're really who we wanted to be for the president. But, you know, next time it's coming. Your time is coming, pal. Great. Thank you for giving me the space to share that and, and to say that. And dear listeners, please recognize that that was really hard for me to say because it just part of the stigma of the reason people don't talk about this shit is because it is my perception that saying that out loud makes me sound broken mm -hmm. or pitiful, like I need pity or like I am literally just financially unstable and broke and... That's not even the truth. Yeah. I have real debt from real life experiences. Mm -hmm. It's not just that I pissed away my money because I felt like it. Like, I genuinely have this debt and there's nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. Except slowly chip it away, which also is depressing as fuck. Like, yep. what am I spending my whole and entire life doing? Chipping away at this debt. That's sad. Mm -hmm. I fucking hate that. Oh my god. Debt. I'm really not looking forward to an episode on debt, but we will do an episode yeah. on debt. So on the COVID note, seniors are being extremely impacted due to having to isolate further. Oh my god. And the fact they have less use of social media and they're already isolated. I can't imagine. I genuinely can't imagine how difficult it would be to be of a generation like that mm -hmm. during this time. Yeah. So that's basically what I had on the COVID depression piece. Essentially, it shot up. Nobody's shocked by that, but no, I felt it still needed to be said. Did any of your research include or did you see any information about depression in children through COVID? No, not that I found specifically. 
Can we just talk about that for a second, though? Sure. I'm really curious about the after effects that COVID will have on our children, purely in like in a sociology perspective. I know from groups that I am in that some children are suffering without having interaction, but I also think we tend to forget that children are very... They are resilient. Thank you. Okay, so yes, I would agree with you that they're resilient. However, think about future state with me for just a second, Mm -hmm. okay? I'm not saying necessarily that children are getting depression from COVID because of this experience currently, but think about the stage that this is setting for them mentally and emotionally, right? To truly... And this could be good or it could be bad. We don't know. Nobody knows because Mm -hmm. we haven't gone through this in a hundred plus years. I mean, seriously, when was the last time we had a genuine pandemic when shit shut down like this? Mm -hmm. Like a hundred years ago, right? Spanish flu, I think. So we don't know the effects of this. But I think about children all over the world at this point have experienced genuine loss. Mm Mm-hmm. Whether that be because the, the the virus took somebody they care about or because they've lost their friends, because they've lost their routines, they've lost their school, their teachers. Some kids have lost everything because they've lost their school. Yeah. All kids are experiencing a different level of loss, but every single child is, in fact, experiencing loss right now. And I just genuinely question how this will mold the next generation of children, like the generation that that Tiny is in. Mm-hmm. How will this affect that group of children as they grow up? Will they be more susceptible to triggers? Will they be more susceptible to reactions, event-based reactions? Because... I mean, Tiny is seven years old, and this is the biggest thing that's ever happened to her. Mm -hmm. This will leave a mark on her. She will never not remember this. Yeah. What will that do to her? And obviously, everybody's trying to make the best of the situation, but I am very curious how many children are currently experiencing a form of depression and suffering through it right now, but also... How many children this will be basically like a pre-existing condition for? Yeah, I get what you're saying. I'm very curious about that. Mm -hmm. And maybe there won't be anything. Maybe, again, the Matrix will flip and everything will be back to normal and this will all just be a bad dream. Like, who knows? Mm -hmm. But seriously. I think it's really going to depend on the age group as well. I think think you're absolutely right. I think about like seniors. Like my sister is a senior this year. I think this is going to really fuck with her. I'm actually going to take a step away from the senior thought, but this still does apply to seniors. But I think children who are old enough to recognize that this isn't normal. Mm -hmm. So your third graders through seniors, basically, right? Those Because those people are still children. Mm -hmm. Even seniors can be children. So I, I really think like age groups who know that this is not fucking normal will be impacted the most and probably have been but then i also just firsthanded i can see tiny and her friends and they're just so hungry to be together Mm -hmm. and yet that's not an option Mm -hmm. what does that do to their little psyches i don't know yeah the only thing we can do is wait and see but i think about shit like that Mm mm-hmm I think it's weird because normally you're the optimist and I'm the realist. And I know. This is where I just go back to the, I truly believe kids are resilient. And this is not going to be as impactful on the majority of children as I think you might think it will be. Yeah. I, and I think that that's a really good point that normally I am, I'm the optimism prime and I totally, I totally play that role because I, that's just how I work. And yet at the same time, The reason that I feel so convinced that this is something that should be considered and potentially prepared for 
is because I have a seven year old mm-hmm. who's living through it. And I, I can tell, I can, I can feel her. I know her. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying she's depressed. I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying she knows something's fucking wrong. Mm-hmm. She knows this is weird. It does bother her. It, it, she feels trapped and isolated. And the same thing that adults are feeling. And she recognizes that she is trapped and isolated because we all are. She knows that COVID is at fault for this. She knows what's happening. Yet she doesn't understand Mm -hmm. what's happening. And it's just a very strange thing as a parent to witness your child going through while you're also experiencing the same thing, but from a completely different perspective. Yeah. So I think part of the reason that I, maybe it's me projecting, maybe that's part of it, but I I don't think that that's all of it because I'm experiencing this shit and I'm like, this is fucking with me. You're experiencing this shit. This has to be fucking with you. And again, because I can feel her, I know something is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I kind of just attribute it to that, to that because I don't feel it from her any other time. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't think anybody has a good answer. No, I think only time will tell. I agree. But I really appreciate that we were able to explore that. Yeah. So the final portion I had of this before diving into some listener... Perspectives? Yeah. I was going to say experiences. I guess both are accurate. Are issues that I've noted. Okay. Why don't people seek help? Well... It's fucking hard when you're depressed. Oh, so hard. And you don't even know you're depressed. Yeah. And it's fucking hard. And like, it's so fucking hard. I don't think I can stress that enough. Mm-mm. A lot of mental health issues aren't covered under insurance. Nope. What the fuck? Yep. We don't... Also, most places don't offer time to deal with mm-hmm. mental health yeah. specifically. And dealing with mental health is not the same as dealing with a physical injury mm-hmm. or or a health complication physically. Yeah. It's not the same. So that might be part of it, too, is that you can't, you, you need to work to pay for the insurance that is covering a sliver mm-hmm. of your mental health bills, right? Yeah. But you can't go to work because you need a mental health day, but your work doesn't offer you a mental health day because they don't value your mental health the same way that they value your physical health Mm -hmm. like that's that's a very common thing in companies yeah how many companies won't look at you weird for calling in and saying i need a mental health day right exactly Uh, on that note there's an economic impact on both the overall overall and personal economy so from a personal job perspective where you're missing work due to your mental Mm -hmm. health and staying at home and from an economic perspective depression is one of the leading causes of what is the word i'm looking for basically it slows down function which it's, whose function the business what are we talking about overall economic function for the economy in general if somebody calls in it hinders another part of an economic business oh so basically you're referring to the ripple effect of me calling out of work today yes for a mental health. okay yes. okay okay i really was not going there with you yeah it's one of the leading causes of loss of economic growth essentially due to that so this just made sense to me because i think about if i call in for the day because I need a mental health day, that doesn't make a big deal. But if people are calling in for a mental health day at the rate in which people actually suffer from these illnesses, that's millions of people. Yeah. So now I do understand what you're saying. It is a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. Then the final issue that I was kind of thinking about is there's a huge lack of resources. There's inaccurate assessments as far as what is wrong and Finally, and probably one of the biggest ones, is the social stigma still surrounding mental health. Not only that, but also something that I want to add to that thought is medication. So before how you were talking about therapy and medication together is the best result, Mm -hmm. 
I'm I'm in support of that, okay? I am pro therapy, I am pro medication if it means you're healthy, if it means it gets you to where you need to be to live your life, okay? But specifically with depression, and I can speak to this from experience, depression meds are a fucking guessing game. Mm -hmm. Most meds are a fucking guessing game. And that's not to say that the meds don't work. It's to say, to what level do they work with your body? Yeah, exactly. Coming up with the exact amount of medicine that works for you is so complicated. There is not a good answer. And this isn't discrediting doctors or pharmacists or people who study medicine. This isn't this isn't criticizing them. What I'm saying is everybody's body is so different mm-hmm. that a percentage of medicine for me is not going to do shit for for you. Yeah, exactly. Or vice versa or whatever. And then also, this gets even more complicated because I can personally speak to this as well. I have a thyroid issue, okay? Mm -hmm. I have hypothyroidism. My thyroid isn't as dead as my mother's, who basically doesn't have one, but mine definitely needs a kickstart, okay? I require, my body requires the brand name medication, Because when I take the generic medication, the pills are not regulated the same by the FDA. And this is true. This is true for all medications. The way that the medicine is monitored is by lot, which means what is in the contents of your bottle. So specifically for, again, I'm going to make this about my thyroid for a second because this is how I can speak to it. But this is real for all medicine. Specifically, when I take levothyroxin, levothyroxin, which is the generic brand, the Walmart brand, okay, that shit is not measured by individual pill. And I am supposed to take 75 micrograms of this medication every day. When I take the generic brand, I might get 50 micrograms in one pill and I get 100 micrograms in the pill the next day. And I can feel the fucking difference. The average of my bottle, of my levothyroxine bottle, Mm -hmm. is 75 micrograms per bottle. So they take the mean of all of the pills, and that's where they get your average of 75. Whereas with the brand name, which in my experience is Synthroid, That is genuinely measured per pill. So every single pill has the exact amount of medication that I need in it. Why is this relevant, Celeste? Because, dear listener, depression meds could be the same. You could be experiencing the exact same phenomenon with depression meds. And this isn't even me saying that brand is always better. What I'm saying is, they're monitored differently. The companies that sell that brand name drug are monitored by the FDA differently. Why? That's a great fucking question and we should have an episode on it. I don't know. What I do know is you never fuck with thyroid medicine, heart medicine, or liver medicine. You never fuck with those. Just always get brand name. Like dead serious. Just do it. I've never heard this before. Mm -hmm. I have had several conversations with therapists, not therapists about it, with pharmacists about it and a couple of my doctors, including Magic Hands, because sometimes I feel like he's the only one who listens to me. Mm -hmm. So this is real. And I think about not only, so back to depression, right, or any sort of mental illness that they can offer you medication for. Not only do I think about how difficult it is to measure how much medicine you need to feel better, but I also think about then on a much more granular level, the medicine that you take every single day, are those pills what you need every single day to the to the degree you need them to be? Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Like, that's scary. Mm-hmm. And fucked up that 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 we would even need to think about that that yeah. that we can't even trust what's 
being put into our pill bottles. Mm -hmm. And we don't know that this is a thing. But it is. And I have first-handedly experienced it. And I can tell you, on a day where my meds, my thyroid meds, are not a 75 microgram pill, I can tell. And on a day that my pill is too high, I can tell. I will literally flip-flop between being hypo and hyper in a matter of days. And I only have hypo. Mm -hmm. So to feel my body kick into hyperthyroidism is fucking terrifying. It's basically like I'm on crack. Mm -hmm. That's what I feel like. And it's just because my pills are different. And then to your point about money, let's bring this back to that. Medication is expensive. Yep. So unbelievably expensive. At least here in the U.S. Here in the U.S. And and that's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. So, again, for my example, I can't get my Synthroid mm -hmm. because it's not covered by my insurance. I don't know why. they. I don't know. I haven't called them and I should, but it's not covered by my insurance. They keep rejecting it and giving me the brand name, which they say it's the same thing. It's fine. And I'm standing here saying to everyone who will listen, it's not the same thing. It's not fine. I can't afford Synthroid by itself. It's literally a $240 a month prescription without any coupons or insurance. Mm -hmm. I can't afford that. And do I need this medication to live? No. Would it make my life better? Fuck yes, but then think about medication that is required to live. Mm -hmm. Insulin. Yep. Insulin is stupid fucking expensive. Yeah, this is definitely a whole other episode. It is. It absolutely is. But we promised you an organic conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying because it, it counts. Well, no, that's a true. No, it's absolutely a true. And it counts point. for depression meds too. Mm -hmm. But then think about that. Think about that being a piece of depression on its own. I can't afford the medication that I need to fucking live. Yep. I can't do it. Yeah. And my insurance isn't helping. And my doctors want to help. But also the insurance thinks that they know more than my doctor does. And it's just literally this like circle jerk of fucking failure for you as the patient. Mm-hmm who is suffering from all of those things. And all you're trying to do is get out. All you're trying to do is get healthy mm -hmm. and be able to see the light. Yeah. That's that's fucked up. Mm -hmm. And that's our society. Yep. So uh, there's a call out that I wanted to make. Um, there is a influencer. She's a YouTube beauty guru. I don't Sam, Sam, you're not going to listen to this. Dear Sam. But if you listen to this. I don't know what to call you. We love you, though. So, Samantha Ramondal, probably butchered her last name. Sorry about that. Has some very real and honest conversations on her channel about mental health. The last one that she had about depression was so open and honest and beautiful and just gritty and sarcastic not in a bad way. Like, mm -hmm. Sam is sarcastic. I she's swear to God. She's amazing. She is. I'm pretty sure she's my spirit animal. But I will leave the link for it in the show notes because I want everybody to go watch it because she says things so beautifully about her experiences personally with depression that I think truly need to be heard. Yeah, I just wanted to call that out because I think it's really important for people that have big platforms to give this mm -hmm. a voice i agree i agree and i i really appreciate that you offered that because i think about another perspective being our listeners might hear us and they might think that this is just our experience but it's not enough to validate their emotions or or their thought processes on it because they have a different experience i don't ever think it hurts to gain more information from multiple perspectives mm -hmm. and that could be said on anything but especially with mental health of any kind, I think it's so important to be as open as possible to as many different experiences so that you can truly find who you click with. Yeah, I agree. And who you can rely on. And even if that just means I feel less depressed when I listen to Watsky, mm -hmm. right? Watsky has my Save Me song. Mm-hmm. 
I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't found him. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know my Save Me song if I hadn't found Watsky. And the only reason I did that is because I experienced something outside of my norm. I think one thing, too, is for some reason, sometimes we suffer less when we know there's somebody experiencing something similar to us. I agree. I agree. It's almost like a trauma bonding, even if you're not actually bonding. Yeah. It validates the experience. Agreed. And on that note, that's kind of a really great segue for this next section. I'm really excited. So this next portion, we had reached out on our social medias to ask people for examples of how depression manifests for them. Mm -hmm. Before I share those, you had shared your experience with depression earlier, and I had said, (laughs) please hold for mine. Mm -hmm. So I will kind of dive into that now. I didn't really experience depression. I'm sure I had minor episodes growing up. I was a cutter in high school. I did self-harm. That's for a different episode someday. I truly feel that was outside of depression as I now understand it. Mm -hmm. I don't think I understood what depression was until after I had moose, with postpartum depression being the start of it. So I have had depressive episodes since having him that don't manifest in, uh, they don't manifest in like suicidality Mm -hmm. or anything like that. It's mostly a lack of self-worth and um, that's pretty much it, a loss of sense of self and and things of that nature. I actually just got out of one and my own personal coping methods are, it's not reaching out to people. Like when people reach out, I'm less likely to talk about it because then it makes me focus on it. Yep. Generally, my coping method is music, Mm -hmm. and I have one specific song, much like you, that I go to to pull me out of it, and it wasn't happening this past time. Normally, I go to yeah. Normally, I go to Tool Reflection because like that's my theme song. Yep. But for some reason, I've just been in it for the past, I'd say, a month and a half or so, and I was thinking about it the other day just as to why I was in this funk. And there's a few things that I think might be contributing to it. One of it being I started a new migraine medication that I think could be messing with it. Um, So I'm going to mess around with that. The other being I haven't had time to work out. And as I've said, working out is very key to me being happy with myself and my body. And it provides me with really good happy feelings. So that's something that I have to prioritize and get back into my life again. The other night, I was actually editing our blooper reel, and as I was editing, I was listening to Aesop Rock's new album, Spirit World Field Guide, and literally my brain just, like, clicked, and I was happy again. It was so weird, because all of a sudden I was like, and I'm I'm done. I'm back to my normal alley self. Mm-hmm. And it was weird, because I've never experienced a turn-off moment like that. But you can I've, always feel the turn on. Yeah. I felt myself like climbing out of it, but then it was all of a sudden just like mm. gone. But for me, talking about it to people I know doesn't help me because I don't really have a good because. It's just not who I am as a person. That's fair. I think also part of it is that just... This is my perception as your best friend and I could be totally fucking wrong because you're dead inside and maybe I'm putting way too much thought into it, but I do know you well enough to know that you don't, you don't like burdening people. That's true. So I think maybe part of it is that you don't want to talk about it because not only do you not want to go through it yourself, but you don't want to burden somebody else with what you're experiencing and if that is the case, like... I want you to know you could never burden me. I'm not challenging the way that you deal with what you deal with. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying the words to you so that you know you could never burden me. I appreciate that. I think part of the thing for me is I have a hard time explaining Mm -hmm. why I'm in when I'm in one because I don't fucking understand. And sometimes there is no explanation. Yeah, and I get frustrated when I don't understand something and then trying to explain to somebody who is truly only trying to help only frustrates me more. And then I don't like people trying to fix things for me. That's a big part of my personality. I would rather take the reins myself. Mm -hmm. 
which is why I called out in the beginning of the episode, we're not trying to fix things. We just want to be here to listen. Exactly. So if you relate to me in that sense, please know you're not alone and it's totally fine. And <laughs> you're not alone. Hi, I'm here. Team Dead Inside. Join me. It's fun. Join me. <laughs> and so I, I have a different, I do have a different experience, even from the one that I shared before, which was directly related to my postpartum. But before I, before I talk about my side of it, what I want to say is I knew something was wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I want to ask you mm -hmm. genuinely, did I approach it okay? Yeah, you were fine. Okay. Because I, I, all I said was, I hear you. I know something's wrong. If you want to talk about it, I'm here. We don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. As you could tell, I just shut you down. You did. So. <laughs> you did. You did. You did completely shut me down. Yeah. So I just appreciate that you didn't push. And that's really what I'm, that's what I want to offer to our listeners is you don't have to push for an answer when somebody wants specifically around mental health. There are other issues that can happen to someone where pushing to talk about it is the right move. Mm -hmm. This isn't one of them. Agreed. This isn't one of them. So truly just respecting that boundary of if you don't want to talk, just know I'm still here and I still love you mm -hmm. C because that's important. Because what you, what you said is that you don't feel you have self-worth in the same way as you do not in an episode. Mm -hmm. So hearing that you do still have worth absolutely is necessary. I agree. So as your best friend, that's my job yep. is to just tell you, you have worth. You're beautiful. I love you. I'm right here no matter what. Like, that's my job. Mm -hmm. It's not my job to fix you. Yep. And I couldn't no matter no matter what, even though I would do anything and give everything to make it better, I don't have that power. Yeah. So there's no point in pushing you and hurting you in the process of trying to help. Yeah, I agreed with all of that. Um, I also now realize that one of my, actually two of my main um, defense mechanisms, triggers, okay, are lack of sleep. Yep. Which a certain toddler in my life, who has, shall remain nameless, <laughs> has been seen to that lately. And then uh, stress. Mm -hmm. In general, I have nothing particularly stressful in my life, but my brain makes things stressful. So, yeah, go brain. I think you hyper stress on things sometimes. Like, I can't even tell you how many times where I've heard you say like, oh, I didn't clean the house. And I'm like, it looks fucking great in here. <laughs> and you're like, no, there's fucking dog hair everywhere. And I'm like, there is fucking dog hair everywhere but in it's, my house. But your house isn't dirty. Oh, my God. We end up with Mabel's hair in our mouth all the time, which is why we record at your house. Which is why we record here, apparently. And I have a cat that sheds like fucking crazy, so I don't understand. But but what I'm saying is I think that you hyper stress on certain things sometimes because of whatever reason you do. And that's okay. That's a very normal thing. Everybody does that about something. But when you say you don't have stress, I sort of me I sort of got the impression that you were in a way diminishing your own experience and I don't like that either. I get what you mean. So I just I'm just offering that perspective to you also and again that's okay. Mm -hmm. So my experience with non pregnancy related depression, I was like what is it called when you have a baby? I didn't know what that face was. I know. I made a really I winked at her but like in like a painful way cuz I was searching the cavity of my brain to look for the word pregnant. Um in a non-pregnancy related state, I have also experienced depression and I am not the same. Mm -hmm. Which is why I want to share this perspective of my experience because people are one or the other. They either pull in or they push out. Yeah. I push out. I experience depression in the same sense as you do of I feel as though I lack self-worth. I feel overwhelmed. I there's there's a lot, right? And my triggers are very different. It does not help that I have PTSD. Mm -hmm. So I'm a complicated little thing, right? And everybody could say that. 
My experience with depression specifically, however, and my depression has been onsought by my PTSD, Mm -hmm. it has been onsought by the fact of I have experienced some really traumatizing things in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm very good in fight mode. I, I, I will fight until I die, right? And to an extent, your body gets addicted to that. Your body gets addicted to that adrenaline. And even sometimes when things aren't wrong and you don't need to fight, your body is convinced you do. I don't know how to relax. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to shut down. I don't know how to sleep. I don't, I don't know how to do these things. Because in those moments, I'm not fighting. And I don't even mean in an argumentative sense. I mean fighting for something. Mm -hmm. Again, dear listener, please hear me say we've been through some really traumatic shit. At this point in my life, things are a lot better. They're a lot, they're significantly better. Like almost gone completely. Mm -hmm. The really dramatic crazy shit is almost gone completely. And yet my body at this point has been so conditioned to fighting all the time that now that I don't have anything to fight about, my body's like, I don't know what to fucking do. Mm -hmm. And I went, I went into extreme depression because my body's like, we're not doing anything. Now you're useless. Yeah. And that has really fucked with me. And again, my own experiences, my own traumas, my own whatever throughout my whole life, and throughout yours, like, everybody could say this. This this isn't even a, a unique to Celeste experience. Like, anybody could say this, which is why it's so important for you to hear. It just happens. Mm-hmm. And in, in my experience of depression, it comes in stages. So I am the queen of analogies, right? My analogy for my experience with depression is like a day at the beach. And when I am good, I am on the beach and I love my life and the sun is shining and it's 82 and sunny and sort of humid, but it's the best day ever, Mm -hmm. right? And the water is the perfect temperature and I love it. And then all of a sudden I'm in the water and it's kind of cold, but I'm only up to my ankles and tiny is splashing around me and everything is okay, but I feel the water yeah, and it's cold. And then... The next stage is that I'm up to my waist and I'm starting to think, okay, mm, maybe we should turn around. And then I'm treading and I'm starting to get tired. I'm just in this perpetual state of treading and tired. Mm -hmm. Like know that when I'm at the point of treading water, I am tired, not even physically tired. I just, my arms are tired. I am tired. I don't want to keep going. Mm -hmm. And then the next stage, the f- the final stage of this mental process for me is 60 feet underwater. Yeah. Looking straight up and all I can see is the sun shining down on me through the water. Mm-hmm. And I'm choking on the pressure of being so far underwater. And yet it doesn't hurt. I'm just numb. Yeah. I'm cold and I'm pressurized and I'm just numb. Yeah. And those stages don't always go in that order. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I will go from the beach to 60 feet under in a day or or whatever. Like, that happens. That's my experience. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in that place, I need people. Yeah. I don't, I can't shut out. I might try to, but really that's not what works for me. Mm -hmm. I can't fix that by myself and that's not to say that i don't try that's not to say it's not my responsibility to take my mental health seriously and to do it for myself and i absolutely do that i take responsibility for that but at the same time somebody's got to come along with a boat Mm -hmm. because i can't get back to shore without one and that's my experience i appreciate that analogy thank you so i did want to share that Not only for the analogy, because it's a great analogy, and for anybody who might be struggling to explain what depression feels like, feel free to use that analogy if it makes sense for you. Or use it to to build your own analogy that better describes your stages. Maybe you don't have as many stages as I do. But the point was, Allie and I operate differently in the help that we need 
to process through those moments. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And to your credit, you always show up with the boat when I need you. That's because you call me. And you know something's wrong when I call you because I never actually call you. Well, no, I mean you reach out. That's true. But I do actually call you. What? And how often well. do I call you on the phone? <laughs> true. Never. So some shit's wrong if I'm calling you. Because I don't answer. It's true. That is true. But you're not wrong. It is my responsibility to ask for help if I need it. Well, it's my responsibility to notice, but generally you ask before I notice. That's because, again, I can go through those different stages of at the beach very quickly. Yeah. And I I am to the point. Also, hear, hear me say this, you guys. I didn't know that when I first was experiencing what I was experiencing. It took talking through my symptoms and my experiences to someone else to come up with that analogy, to recognize what it was. That's okay. You mm -hmm. don't have to have the answers, which is also part of why we're talking about this today. If you don't know the answers, hear us say, we don't either. Nobody does. Yeah. It comes down to your experience, your feelings, what you need for you, how you process all of it. And it is your responsibility as a person, an individual to deal with that. But the people who love you, who are around you, us, your family, your friends, your children, your animals, anybody who cares about you, anything that cares about you, it's okay to find comfort in those things too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do need to ask for it, but don't be ashamed to do that. Agreed. I think that's an important message from this too. Yes, I agree 100%. So can we can we talk about some other people's experiences that they shared with us? Yes, and I just brought up the Twitter thread too because I realized a lot of people DM'd me because mm -hmm. they were uncomfortable sharing on social media publicly. Which is absolutely okay. We're keeping all this anonymous regardless whether yep. you shared it publicly or not. So I definitely responded on the Twitter feed publicly, so mine's not anonymous. Okay, so to start out, one of the first people that replied to me was a gentleman. He stated that he had depression on and off throughout his most of his adult life, but paternal depression manifesting after his child was born was the worst. He and I had a really good discussion, and one of my main takeaways was, why do we not talk about postpartum depression for dads? That's a fascinating... Before I address that, though... I love that not only the first example you gave was a man, but also that it is a dad thing. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say that out loud because yeah. men, mental health for men is also so important. This is not just a women thing. No, and that's definitely a future episode that I want to have. Men talking about mental health is such a huge fucking stigma mm -hmm. and I just don't understand it. I just don't understand why society can deem that men shouldn't talk about things that are that are normal human experiences. Like, why do men have to pretend to be emotionless? I And some of them pretend to the degree that they truly become emotionless. Mm -hmm. I just struggle with that. So, men, hear us say your mental health is just as important as anyone else's so to this note yes after moose was born and not a single healthcare professional asked me how nick's mental health was which is so fucked up mm -hmm. and yet at the same time you know what honestly if somebody had asked me how my co-parents mental health was after we had tiny i probably would have i probably would have swung on him I don't think I would have because I still felt responsibility to him. And that's fair, but you have a very different experience than I do. Oh, yeah. So I just am trying to – I put myself in that doctor's office, like fly on the wall, right? And your, men, your, your healthcare providers are asking you how you're doing, but nobody asks about Nick. That makes me upset. And then I think about me being in a doctor's office 
asking about my health and my experiences after having Tiny. And if somebody asked me how my co-parent was doing, I would have swung on him. Yeah, I can respect that. I just think that there needs to be there needs to be something. There does. You're not wrong about that at all. I just don't know what that I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. Here's the other thing. So is it really fair in that situation to put that stress on you as well? Like the stress of is your partner okay right now? And I hear you say that you feel responsible for him, but you're also a brand new mom. You are responsible for this thing that won't stop crying and pooping and eating and is so cute and at the same time is driving you crazy. And now you also are accountable for his experiences and feelings, which I'm not saying that you don't care about his experiences and feelings. What I'm saying is, is it fair for a doctor to sit you down and say, okay, Allie, you're here for your three-week checkup. Moose is great. You say you're great. How's your husband? Like, do, would you even know? I'm not certain, but to that point, he's just as responsible as I am for all the things that you listed. Absolutely. So I guess where I was going with that was, is it then on the healthcare professionals to be asking the dads directly? Oh, that's what I mean. There needs to be something. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we were saying the same thing. What I'm saying is, I don't think it's fair to ask you that question for him. I think that that's something that doctors should be reaching out to the dad specifically and saying, how are you with this? I just don't know if that's something that they can necessarily do. Um, Just something needs to be done. I don't disagree and I don't have an answer, Mm -hmm. but I, I don't disagree with you at all. So the rest of these are essentially quotes. Okay. I either eat consistently or not at all. There's no in between. Sometimes it's crying in the shower. Other times it's throwing myself into the podcast so I don't have to listen to my own mind. No one would ever know when I'm not right. The worse I am, the more I won't discuss. Hi, me. It's a battle with your own mind. Even knowing what you're experiencing, you can't reason your way out of it. That is so real. Mm Mm-hmm. It starts with the manic, I have to do everything to the letter episode, and then when I don't meet it to the letter, I start spiraling and nothing is appealing. I tend to sleep and read nonstop with no desire to eat or hang out with anyone. That's me. Those aren't my words, but that's me. Also, as a note, a lot of these are condensed. I took... Like the highlights? The cliff notes? Because these were actual conversations. Yep. Okay. I appreciate you saying that. It manifests as disconnection for me, being so utterly focused on something that I am unable to connect to anyone around me. That's you. Yeah, I'd say so. I isolate myself. I don't want to be a downer to others or a burden. That's both of us. Yep. I've called off work, gone hours laying in bed feeling absolutely nothing, not being hungry, not doing anything about watching movies that made me cry. I wouldn't even shower until I finally decided I stunk too much not to. Mm, that one hurt. I try to keep my mind busy with chores around the house and work because I don't want to think about what's wrong. Admitting to myself I'm depressed is extremely hard and sharing my feelings with my partner was even harder. Also felt... It's hard to explain, but I felt like I was being stalked by death. Oh my god, that one's fucking holy shit. Whoever wrote that, if you are listening right now, holy shit, I have felt that and I've never been able to express that in words. And that is that is what it feels like. It just It's just this thing that's like over your shoulder and you can feel it breathing down your neck and yet it's not there. Thank you for sharing that. Because that means something to me. I bury myself into routine when I've been depressed. I follow the exact same structure every day, including what and when I eat, and lose motivation for doing anything outside of that basic schedule. So it's like hyper-focused on everything, and that's just just how you cope. Mm -hmm. For me, it's the feeling that anything is overwhelming, even the simplest things. I can't do laundry. I can't brush my teeth. It manifests the untrained eye as laziness, but it, to me, it's a wave of feeling so overwhelmed I physically can't bring myself to do these tasks. Felt. 
feelings of not being enough and feeling like I have no right to feel the way I do because I've had a good life. And that's what I was talking about before. Yep. And that is something that everyone needs to get away from because it doesn't matter if you've lived a good life, which is something to be grateful for, but depression is not an external thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you have or what you've surrounded yourself with or even who you've surrounded yourself with. This is something that happens inside of people and you have every right to talk about it. Your feelings are valid. Your feelings are important. It doesn't matter that you've lived a good life. You deserve to be able to talk about it. Agreed. For me, I think the biggest thing is apathy. I can't bring myself to care about anything. Not happy or sad or even angry. I just feel numb. We've talked about how dangerous and disgusting and just bad apathy can be i i can't imagine i can't imagine though that's not even fair to say apathy toward yourself that is the ultimate level of dangerous apathy and please no we're not calling you no. dangerous or disgusting no 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 it's purely the emotion yeah. that you're experiencing it isn't you as the host of that emotion thank you for stopping that that train of thought in case anybody thought that that's where i was going with that it's apathy Apathy is dangerous. Mm -hmm. For me, it's working on overload, very productive, and trying to avoid the feelings and then a total crash. I can also relate to that deeply. For me, it's irritability. I will snap at people close to me and just want to be alone. I don't get anything done like errands, cooking, or cleaning. Before I know it, my bedroom is a disaster and things in my life pile up. That's real. I am tired, grumpy, hot, uncomfortable in my own skin, overwhelmed, stressed, uneasy, on edge, and I don't know why. Mm. I think that that's a good moment to call out that depression can manifest itself in physical symptoms, too. Mm -hmm. You can be sick. Yep. You can be, like, you can have the flu, but you don't have the flu, and you're just sick. Like it feels like you got hit by a bus and it you're like you're dehydrated, but you're not. Yeah. Like it like you or or you just climbed a fucking mountain and you're just exhausted, but you literally just moved from the couch to your bed. Mm -hmm. It can manifest so physically that you are convinced there is something wrong with you physically. Yeah. And truly, it's just the way your brain is working. For me, it's an overwhelming feeling of sorrow and just wanting to be alone. It affects my work and I get really lazy, like I just want to lay around and watch TV with a blanket and ice cream. From experience and from what I've seen, I would say irritability and just drawing into a shell are the two biggest manifestations of depression in and around me. Serious spirals of hopelessness, self-destructive behavior, self-isolation. I used to get verbally hostile, but I've been able to tamper that down. All this is amplified by my bipolar, so I have moments of lightness and then fall back into the dark. Mm. That hurts my heart. Sometimes it drains all my energy and the most basic tasks are impossible. The sadness associated with it often leaves me pretty low. But there have been moments on the other side where it sparked incredible creativity. However, I wish the dark part wasn't necessary. Mm -hmm. Self-isolation. I'll usually stop talking to friends, I'll delete social media, I'll mute all my group chats, and then I kind of wallow. Physically unable to do anything. I forget to shower, and then I feel gross, which deepens my depression to a point that I start to believe I am unworthy of a shower, and then I finally shower and I stay in there for like five hours because it feels so good and I'm afraid that I'll never get that back. That would hurt. That would hurt. <laughs> I thought you were grabbing my foot. I just, it's the closest thing I, I can touch. That one really, oh my god. 
I was really proud of myself for making through without crying, and you then know, I got to that, that one, one, and I was like, well, now I'm fucked. <laughs> oh my god. And then here's this that we're ending with, so now we're both fucked. Okay. <laughs> bring it bring it on. So to end the listener experiences, this beautiful I wanna call it a poem was sent in. And I feel it needs to be read in its fullness. I'm already crying. I cry and laugh silently, so everybody just still thinks I'm dead inside. (laughs) It's true, you guys. Like, Uh, I'm the loud one no matter what I'm doing. Allie is the quiet one no matter what she's doing. It bites you and it's not a fair fight. You don't see it. It's just there all the time waiting until it does what it does. You can take medication to control it, but it's still there, and you know it is. You feel it in the background. It lingers and it waits, and someday you wake up and you think that all you do is screw up, fail, and bother people. (laughs) I have dealt with it for years and years, and some days it's fine. Other days it makes you not want to do the things you want to do. You can't cure it. It's part of you. It is you. How do you win that fight? I'll let you know when I get there. (laughs) So... Oh my god, it just... Ew. <laughs> I know, I'm just dripping. Like, just my yeah. whole face is fucking dripping. So, as we said, these will remain anonymous. But we know the person that wrote that. And we want to say to them directly... You're worth so much to us. Yep. We love you more than anything. And all of that shit's not true. You're so amazing. <laughs> Yep, all of that. So, genuinely just one of the best people. Just the most beautiful people I've ever met. And I'm so sorry that I'm so sorry that that's your fight, but please know that we love you. And we're so grateful that you shared that with us and that you shared that with our listeners because that's so important and your poem was so beautiful and just know at the same time that just we love you Mm -hmm. we love you so much and i want to extend that to everybody who shared something with us agreed these are this is a very vulnerable thing and it takes everything to be able to put it out there and i know I know it's the holiday season, guys. I know this is supposed to be a cheerful month, but I think it makes it even more important to talk about this. Because there is a very real correlation between depression and the holidays Mm -hmm. for so many people, for so many different reasons. And that's part of the reason I slotted it for this month. That's exactly, that's exactly why we slotted it for this month. And part of me was like, is this a terrible idea? But... It doesn't matter because it's going to be a hard conversation no matter when we have it. We're going to cry no matter when we have this conversation. It's never going to be an easy conversation to have, and that's okay. Just like racism was never an easy conversation, it's never going to be. So please hear us say that we are so grateful. So grateful. To those of you that have shared, and for those of you that are suffering, you are not alone. Mm Mm-mm. And you're not broken. You're you're not. And I'm not going to sit here and say that you're perfect because that's for you to decide. Mm-hmm. But you're not broken. And you're not a failure. And you're not a fuck up. And you do belong here. And if nobody else is willing to tell you, we need you here. Agreed. We need you here. You. Specifically you. Listener. You are needed here. We need you. Mm -hmm. Now that I've grounded myself and I'm in a place where I can temporarily compartmentalize my emotions. Yeah. Are you ready to tell me what you learned today? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. There was a lot of statistics that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate knowing. Um, I also really, really appreciate that you spelled out the six different kinds of depression because I never would have, I, 
obviously they are depressive experiences, right? And I'm sure that's not the right way to say that, but like postpartum depression, depression is in the name. Like Mm -hmm. I'm a fucking idiot that I never correlated that to a type of depression in the concept of what we were talking about. You're not an idiot, but I understand what you mean. Thank you. But I learned that. I didn't realize that bipolar disorder was a type of depression. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really important. It's really important, especially for me, because without getting into anything specifically, I have experiences Mm -hmm. with bipolar disorder, not only in an actual manifestation of somebody else, but also in being accused of being bipolar in a really toxic way. And I've always said there's there's nothing wrong with being bipolar. I'm just not it. And I truly never understood that being bipolar is a depressive thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that that just gives me such a different perspective to it that I I appreciate it a lot because it, it allows me to feel empathy toward the concept of bipolar disorder, whereas before I was not. And that's not to say that I don't feel empathy for people who have bipolar disorder. It is the concept of bipolar disorder that I immediately put my walls up against. Yeah. So knowing that it's a depressive thing makes me a lot more empathetic to it. Mm -hmm. And again, not people, just the illness itself. I get what you mean. And that was really important for me, and I really appreciated learning that. What did you learn here today? I was really shocked by how low the numbers were, honestly, and it just solidifies more in my mind that they're low because people don't talk about it as much, Mm -hmm. and it's just not, it's not at the top of the list like it should be. It's not as focused on as it should be, and I hope as a society that we get there. I hope so, too. Because I think I think it's just as important as physical health. Without question. I actually I actually genuinely think mental health is more important than physical health. And the reason I say that is because physical health can be cured most of the time. Most of the time it can. Mental health is such a different roller coaster because there's only so much that scientists and medical health professionals know about the brain and I go back to the brain is different for everybody. Your heart and my heart look exactly the same anatomically. Your brain and my brain look exactly the same anatomically. But my brain doesn't function like your brain even though my heart functions like your heart. I get what you're saying. I consider them on the same level but I appreciate the sentiment. I'm not saying that it's drastically more important. I want to add that. I'm just saying I do think mental health is is more important. Just even like a fraction of a piece. Mm -hmm. So, dear listeners, I would say that I'm sorry if we made you cry and you got to hear us break down. But I'm really not because the reality of this podcast is that we're real and it's real and... This is a hard topic, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping it helps someone. That's like we started this episode. That's all we can ask for. That's, that is how we define success with our podcast is helping someone Mm -hmm. and, and helping someone with each episode because we know, we know that not every episode applies to you specifically, but maybe the next one does. Mm Mm-hmm. Which is why we cover so many different things and we will continue to cover different things. It's also so important to us that you know that, like we said when we started our No Fucks Given November series, shit gets real. Like, we're not just here to be beautiful and ditzy and funny. That's not who we are. I didn't even realize that we were ditzy, but okay. I can be pretty ditzy. (laughs) Don't even lie to make me feel better. I can be pretty ditzy. But it's just part of my charm. Like, I can't help it. But seriously, there's just so much more to us 
And we would not be giving you an authentic experience of who we are as Allie and Celeste if we didn't have conversations like this. Agreed. Because conversations like this is why we are friends. Mm -hmm. Talking about pole dancing is great and it's necessary and it's important and it's empowering. But that's not why we're friends. Mm -hmm. Because I could have that conversation with anybody. I can't have this conversation with just anybody. I can have this conversation with you. Mm -hmm. It's important to surround yourself with people who you can have this conversation with the same way that Allie and I just did. Even if that doesn't mean the exact same way that Allie and I just did. But to be vulnerable and raw and real and to trust somebody else. To just be there in that moment with you. I think everybody deserves that. I agree. And it's really important to find. One other thing that I wanted to note was I'm going to put some resources in these show notes for anyone that's suffering from depression. If you would like to look into it, to see just how to seek help for it or anything of that nature. Um, Sam's video, the link to her video will also be in the show notes. Like I said, it's a great video. I highly recommend everybody watch it. Speaking of our show notes, uh, this is the part of the episode where we kind of do our outro and it feels a little weird with this episode, but we're still going to do it. We're still going to say if you guys are interested in supporting us so that we can continue to do this, so we can continue to have conversations like this, you're welcome to, we, we welcome you to find our Patreon page. The link is in the show notes. Uh, pick the tier that works best for you, whatever that means. There is some happier content on there. There is happier content. And again, we're going back to happy content, okay? this We're not on a, a downward spiral of just sad shit all the time. That's not who we are either. But again, real conversations need to be had. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in supporting... Again, our Patreon is in the show notes. We are so grateful for everyone who supports in whatever way that means to them, whether that's just listens or people who share the episodes or our podcast or who rate us or support us on Patreon or who buy our cute merch because our graphic designer, shout out Melissa, is so amazing and whatever, whatever that means to you. On that note, we also have a new Patreon. We do have a new Patreon, and did we officially announce that Melissa's our graphic designer? Just on Twitter. Melissa's our graphic designer. We told everybody on Twitter. <laughs> I act No, I know for a fact I told people on Facebook and Instagram, but dear listeners, we have a graphic designer. Her name is Melissa, and she's beautiful and amazing, and I guarantee you she ugly cried during this episode. So, dear Melissa, we love you, and we're sorry we made you ugly cry. <laughs> and we want to thank Mike and we suspect Louise. <laughs> I'm really going with it's Louise. <laughs> For being our newest Patreon. Thank you, Louise. And also, Mike, you get a thank you also if it was really you or you were part of it. But your name was on the card. Thank you, both of you, one of you, either of you, for the love and support. Louise, I know it's you, girl. <laughs> In case you guys are wondering what... um our patreon funds actually go to i think our next purchase is an upgrade for our headphones because yeah. we're currently using i'm using a gaming headset that is killing looks my like ears. it's from the 90s this thing is cool as shit you leave it alone and celeste is using some earbuds that are they were skull candies they were 897 from walmart I'm telling you once we get new ones it's gonna be a whole new why world. don't we use my gaming headphones i don't know we should do that. Either way, we should just get some better headphones. You're not wrong, but we should we should try my gaming headphones. I have two pairs. And maybe an actual website for people to continue to not use. Not wrong. But <laughs> also, I think this is a good this is a good piece too to talk about just introductory, okay? We are in the fetal stage of this concept, but something else that our Patreon funds are gonna go toward are different charities. We want to be able to be in a place financially to help contribute to different charities with our show funds. Like, mm -hmm. that's really important to us. And we will do different charities because there are so many charities that are worth helping. 
Um, I think at some point when we get there, there will be a tier that you get to help us decide or there will be a function of a tier that you get to help us decide which charity we choose to donate to for the month. Yeah. So, or the quarter or however often we do it. Um, but you get to be a part of that decision with us. And if that's the Trevor Project one month and then it's a no-kill shelter another month, like, we we want to do that. And mm-hmm. there's no there is no limit to the charities that we want to help. And there's no qualification of a charity in the sense of like if we're helping people that's all we care about agree so that's coming also i think that pretty much covers it i kind of feel like it does thanks as usual to our twitter fam and all that jazz all that jazz extra special shout out this week to josh from dads on day quill because he loved on us so hard this week and also his post about our episode that released today meaning the day that we recorded he said i love these girls to pieces and it was just the cutest he's so cute i love josh uncle josh shout out to him i just love our podcast family i do too i do too but he really he hit me in the feels today so he needed a special shout out he always posts such wholesome content i know and yet he's like the raunchiest one of all of them (laughs) he literally go from like d's nuts to being like oh i love babies (laughs) i swear to god his actual job is writing inspirational posters it has to be i swear to fucking god it has to be i'm okay with this i love him this week's dad shout out goes to josh that's it also we love the other dads but just saying (laughs) (laughs) i think that's it guys it sure is On that note, do you be taboos.